do we have more widows to talk about? Yes, we do in Luke 7. Luke 7 opens up with the healing of the centurion's servant. We heard about this um, centurion in other chapters in the Bible. This is going to be a centurion of Herod's militia. There were Roman soldiers, but until 44 AD, the soldiers you hear about in Jerusalem are going to be Herod's army. Herod the Great created this massive army force. He defeated the Greek hanger honors, the Maccabees, in the other parts of the country. And this is the remnants, or this is the standing militia that Herod created himself. He was finished with all the things he was saying. He went back to Pernum, and the centurion had a servant who was sick, to the point of death, it says. So when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to the elder of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And this, again, Herod's temple soldiers could have been a Jewish person or could have been captive or a person from another place that had joined the army. But he says, he loves our nation. He is one who built us our synagogue. And so please do this, heal him. You know, he sent his people out. Don't come, don't come. I'm not worthy to have you in my roof. And I didn't think that you would come. And, that, and that's why I didn't think to come to you. But, but I'm like you. You know, I'm a leader of people. I say go and they go. And I say come and they come. So he understood Jesus was that kind of a leader. It says he marveled at him. That he marveled at the centurion, which, you know, would not have been a guy that you would probably marvel at at that time. And he turns to the crowd and says, quote, in ESV, Not even in Israel have I found such faith, meaning this guy is outside of the nation of Israel, and yet he has this kind of faith. Man went back and found that his servant was healed. A centurion wouldn't have been a wanted guy. Again, we find out he's not even from the tribes of Israel. He's an outsider, even though he loves the nation and helped build the temple. But this guy said these amazing things which impressed Jesus. And clearly, this man had faith in Jesus that he could heal the serviceman. He was also so humble. He didn't want Jesus to come to his home, not only because it would have been embarrassing for Jesus to go into a Gentile's home, but that wasn't a point of contention with Jesus. Again, Jesus does not have those rules other people have. Then we go to a town called Nain, Again, the disciples, those are going to be the bigger crowd of followers and the crowd were all near him and found out that a man had died and was being carried out. And this guy was the only son of his mother. So that was leaving this poor woman, a widow with no one to care for her. I mean, she was probably in big trouble besides the fact she missed her son. And And Jesus said he had compassion on her. He told her not to cry. Then he went up to where the bearers of the coffin or the young man were there. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and started talking. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And it says that they were afraid. Again, fear, the word fear sometimes means that they were in awe or they were awestruck. And they glorified God. A great prophet has come among us and visited his people. The word started getting out into the countryside. And of course, because this woman was a widow, she didn't have anyone to care for her. This was her only son. Jesus was not only having compassion on the man who died, but having compassion for the poor widow as well. And so John has been getting word of what Jesus has been doing, reported all these things to him. So John asked two of his disciples to go to the Lord and say, are you the one to come or should we look for another? Are you the Messiah? I was making straight the way of the Lord, the way of the Messiah. I was called to prepare for the Messiah. Are you him? You know, essentially is what he's saying. And so that message went out and told him, are you him or should we look for another? And at that time, Jesus was healing all sorts of people. 
getting rid of evil spirits. And he says, tell John all the things you're seeing, you're hearing, the blind can see and the lame can walk, the lepers and the demon possessed, all of those people are being cured. Blessed is the one who's not offended by me. You know, so John being in prison, I'm sure, you know, again, is a test of faith. You would think, I would think that if I was Jesus' cousin and I had been making the way straight for him, God's going to get me out of prison, right? I'm doing his work. Why am I still in prison? And maybe John is losing faith that Jesus is the one. And John probably grew up his whole life hearing from Elizabeth and Zechariah, probably even knew Jesus all about what the promise of the Messiah was meant to be. Zachariah and Elizabeth knew this, and now I think John is, must be having some sort of doubts. It says that the prison was in Macarius, which was a mountain fortress on the other side, the east side of the Dead Sea, about 15 miles from the mouth of the Jordan River. So it's very desolate. It's in the forest. I heard very gruesome things about this prison, and this is a very awful prison. And that's where John was being kept. And so he's hearing all the things that Jesus is doing, but I think is wondering, are you going to come back for me? This was probably disappointing that he was waiting this long to be removed from prison. And Jesus is telling him, blessed are those who aren't offended by me. Is John becoming offended because Jesus isn't coming back for him, isn't coming to have him removed from prison. When John's messenger left to go back and tell John all these things, Jesus told the crowd, why did you all go out in the wilderness? What did you go out to see? Was it a reed shaken by the wind? Or did you see a man dressed in fancy clothes, living life of luxury? Or did you see a prophet? I'll tell you even more than a prophet. For it was written about him, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. And I'm telling you that there is no one born of woman that is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And then there was a parenthesis that said when people heard this, and including the tax collectors, they said that God was just. They were baptized by John, and the Pharisees and the lawyers, the scribes, rejected John and refused to have themselves baptized by him. And then Jesus continues, while the people in the generations are saying, what is this like? That they're the kids, and someone called them brats, sitting in the marketplace calling to each other. And it says, we played the flute for you, and you didn't dance, and we sang a dirge for you, and you didn't weep. But John comes along, eating no bread. He ate bugs and honey, drinking no wine. You scoffed at him and called him a demon. You scoffed at me because I was eating and drinking and called me a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors. Yet wisdom, here's a personification like the Greeks and the Gentiles like to do. Wisdom is justified by all her children. We are all children of wisdom. The commentaries mentioned that these children were like not playing and they were calling to each other because the other children weren't playing by their rules. They weren't following along. They weren't doing the things that you were supposed to do. And now that the people of this generation, there's, there's two tunes going on. A dirge, which is sadness, which is John telling you to repent and turn back. Or Jesus, who was playing the flute and playing a song for you to rejoice in. And you wouldn't do either of these things. You're not happy with anyone or anything. And no one's playing by your rules. And you're just like brats sitting in the marketplace that nobody wants to play with. Someone cleverly call it the parable of the brats. Pharisees asked to eat with him. He goes over to the Pharisee's house, and this is called Simon the Pharisee, as not to be confused with Simon the leper. A guy said to me once, I don't believe in the Bible because there were two people called Saul. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird because doesn't it make it more realistic because there probably are two people called Saul? Well, here we got two people that Jesus went to their house, Simon the leper and Simon the Pharisee. So you would say, well, if you were writing the Bible as some sort of a novel, a fake novel of how wonderful Jesus is, would you 
have confusing stories like a leper and a Pharisee with the same name? No, you would not. So to me, this makes it more realistic. So Jesus is over the house and this woman comes in who was a sinner and sees that Jesus is reclining because we eat in a reclining fashion in those times. And she begins weeping, wetting his feet with her tears and kissed his feet and anointed it with an ointment. And the Pharisee sees all this and is like, boy, this man's supposed to be a prophet and this woman is like touching him and she's a sinner and this is gross and you know, all that kind of thing. And Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Oh boy. So he's going to let Simon have it and gives him a story. A money lender has two debtors. One has 500 denarius, which is going to be 500 days wages, and another one has 50 denarius. When they could not pay, the money lender canceled the debt of both of them. And, it's a, and he says, which one's going to love him more? Well, Simon's like, well, I guess the guy who had the big debt, right? He's going to be grateful that the debt was canceled. And he says, you know what? See this woman? Her debt was bigger. I came to your house. You didn't water for my feet, but she watered my feet with her tears and cleaned them. You didn't kiss me with a holy kiss, a brotherly kiss, but she came in and she kissed my feet. But you know what? Her sins are forgiven. And that's why she loves so much because she knows how much was forgiven from her. But you, you have forgiven little. You love little too. It's not to say that Simon didn't probably have a million things he could be grateful for for forgiveness, things that he had done. He says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And then people were sitting at the table saying, who is this guy who can forgive sins? And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So it reminds me again, going back to what we were talking about before, that the poor in spirit, in heart, the hungry, the people who are downtrodden and abused by other people, they are going to love God. They are going to weep with joy because they have been forgiven much. They have been given much by the kingdom of God and by the forgiveness of sins and by Jesus and his presence with them. And the people who think they have everything they need, like Simon the Pharisee, they don't really consider much at all. They don't go out of their way. They don't do the common customs of friendliness, of home charity. He didn't do any of that. He didn't care. So I feel like this very last story in this chapter is the Beatitudes come to life. A woman who needs, who hungers, who's poor in spirit, and a man who feels like he has everything he needs. People think in this particular story that the woman was kissing his feet and crying at his feet because he was probably lying down, you know, they, they sort of lounged, right? So she probably couldn't get to the rest of him. Like she probably would have cried in his arms or cried over his head or anointed him with her oil over his head, which was the custom. But maybe because of how he was sitting, she couldn't reach him. So it didn't matter to her. I'm not going to stand on formality. I am going to do this to the feet. Obviously, people walked on their feet. They didn't have socks or nice shoes or clean feet necessarily all the time. She didn't care. She was so desperate to have this connection with Jesus. She would accept any part of him that she could cry on and anoint. People feel, but we don't know at this point, that this woman was Mary Magdalene, that she was the woman who was considered to be the sinner. She was the woman who had the spirits about her, and she was likely a prostitute. Her perfume, her ointment, would have been her calling card, would have been her signature scent that would have attracted men, and she was spilling that out. I don't need this anymore. All I need is this man, Jesus, who saved me. Then that ends chapter 7. I'm going to meditate on the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. I came outside of faith. I had no faith. I had my sins forgiven. God reclaimed me. 
using people in my life to bring me into him when I had no desire at all to become a Christian. Not a very weepy person, but I really should reflect on that more about how Jesus came for me and how that emotion, how that thanksgiving should pour out of me in this genuine, raw emotion way. And what I'm going to pray about are people who look for any way they can to dismiss Jesus, whether they're the brats in the marketplace who won't play by the rules, they won't dance for the happy song, they won't cry for the dirge, they don't have anything that they want from either John the Baptist or Jesus. They dismiss everything and want things only their way. And the thing that I'm going to share with others is the fact that I was saved from God, that I owe that debt that is impossible to pay because Jesus sent someone for me and came for his lost sheep. And I have that eternal gratefulness that he did. I didn't want it, but he sent it anyway. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember you can always send a prayer request to me Jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'm happy to pray for you. I hope you pray for me too. Appreciate your prayers every day.